Hello, my name's Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist in London. I assess mentally disordered offenders. I also work as an expert witness, so I give evidence in criminal trials all across the UK. CrimeCon is coming to the UK. It will be full of experts such as myself and also law enforcement agents. They'll also be your favorite YouTubers and podcast makers. So I really hope to see you there. Three mysterious deaths in a Florida river confound local authorities. A preliminary investigation reveals little. But when police and the FBI find a sinister link to international drug smuggling, they uncover a conspiracy of unbridled greed and ruthless violence. It's a case that thrusts an entire city into chaos. In the 1980s, thousands of violent criminals flooded into America from Cuba and Colombia. Drugs hit South Florida, and the area, bloated with illicit wealth, became a violent powder keg. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. In the bloody Miami drug wars, the winners got rich, the losers buried, and everyone was a target. Colombia, South America. Until the 1970s, life was simple but hard. Then a failed economy gave way to a sharp rise in drug trafficking. The drug trade caused stiff competition that literally began to rip the country apart. Ruthless Colombian drug lords began consolidating their businesses into partnerships known as cartels. Death came to anyone who got in their way. As the cartel's influence grew, so did the American appetite for illicit drugs. And Miami became the prime point of entry for most of the cocaine smuggled into the country. And with it came bloodshed. Colombian assassins were sent to Miami to wipe out the local competition. The homicide rate grew to more than triple the national average for large cities. Miami was named the murder capital of the U.S. Former Metro Dade homicide detective Alex Alvarez recalls how in 1979, violence came to a Miami shopping mall. His date of birth is several drug traffickers bought out a, a, a step van. Uh, lined it with bulletproof vest and portholes and did a drug hit in the parking lot and sprayed it with, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rounds in the parking lot trying to kill their intended target. Two known drug traffickers were killed and several innocent bystanders were wounded. There were also incidents of high-speed pursuits on the expressway between two drug dealers that were just shooting it out on the expressway during rush hour traffic. And, and, and numerous people were being uh, injured and, and killed. It was like the wild, wild west, so there was a need to um, try to curb and stop um, these uh, drug traffickers who seemed to be out of control. A special squad was formed to deal with the violence. Central Tactical Unit, or CENTAC-26, was headquartered at the Metro Dade Police Department. Sergeant George Placencia was a detective assigned to the unit, the first of its kind in Miami. It was a 26 one in the nation. The purpose of forming that task force was that we would go out and monitor all the homicides in Dade County and pick and choose the ones that uh, we thought involved major drug traffickers and, and attempt to work that angle, the homicide angle, and dismantle the organization. By the mid-1980s, 
constant pressure from law enforcement slowly changed the way drug traffickers were doing business in Miami. They got a little bit more sophisticated. They still did the murders, but not the, the, the shootouts in public. Drug traffickers went deep underground, organizing cells that excluded all but family and close friends. Many cells specialized in activities, such as cocaine transportation, distribution, or money laundering. In only a few years, the business had become large and sophisticated, and still very deadly. On the afternoon of July 29, 1985, a marine salvager working on the Miami River noticed something. Off the bow of his boat, floating in the water, was a body. By the time Metro-Dade County Police responded, dock workers had pulled two more bodies from the river. The coroner examined the deceased for any signs of trauma or gunshot wounds. He found none. It appeared that the three had drowned. On the bodies, officers found beepers, Rolex watches, and plenty of cash. Two were armed. Essentially, they were all carrying the tools of a drug smuggler. Metro-Dade police called Syntac 26. Sergeant Placencia investigated. Yeah, hold on, let me write this down. We started doing area cams to see if anybody had seen anything suspicious or had seen these individuals prior to them meeting their demise, and uh, that uh, proved to be, you know, not so fruitful at all. Nobody had seen anything. The three victims were identified as local Cuban Americans. Two had minor police records. The official cause of death was drowning, but there was no indication how they ended up in the water or why. Detective Alex Alvarez searched for a lead in the case. We began running um, uh, records checks and contacting the Drug Enforcement Administration to see if these people were known drug traffickers. Agents at the DEA did not know the men, but they did have a source that could help. Right, right. What's, what's the address? They had an informant, and that informant knew the son of one of the dead people that were fished out of the Miami Rivers, and it was definitely drug-related. And he was going to uh, put us into contact with the son. That afternoon, investigators paid a visit to the son. I don't know why we're here. He was willing to tell what he knew, hoping that the mystery of his father's death could be solved. Can you, can you tell us what you know and how you found out about it? Well, I know it's a really big business. He, brings in thousands he told us that his father was one of the biggest drug smugglers in South Florida. He brought in thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of cocaine. Well, I know last Saturday he said he was. He said his father's crew used rundown steel hulled vessels to smuggle drugs into the country, since the old boats aroused less suspicion than big yachts. He, had him later he also detailed how the smugglers built false bulkheads into the boats, concealing hidden compartments filled with hundreds and sometimes thousands of pounds of cocaine. When customs searched these boats, their only hope of finding drugs would be to use a welding torch. See, the smugglers are, are smart. They know that there's no way that customs and the open ocean is going to put a torch to a boat because if they're wrong, they'll sink the boat. Now safely past customs, the smugglers would continue to move their enormous cargo up the Miami River. They would park at a marina um, and then let it sit there for two or three days to make sure there was no surveillance. And on the second, third, or fourth day, when they were convinced there was no surveillance, they'd come at the middle of the night, unload the, the drugs into vans, and ship them off to different locations within South Florida. The son said he had been visited by two of his father's friends who were on board the ship the night his father drowned. They told him that the boat was raided by a group of gunmen dressed as cops. 
that's where your father was going that night. The Raiders threw the six-man crew overboard and then stole about 450 kilos of cocaine. Each kilo at that time was worth uh, approximately um, $60,000. Uh, so the net retail value of this load was approximately $27 million. Now that's not the street value. The street value is probably two, three times that. The son provided the names of all three men who survived, but said he didn't know how to contact them. The Sentac detectives needed to find out if there had been a legitimate raid at the marina. They contacted every law enforcement agency in South Florida that handled drug cases. None of them um, had any operations uh, close to uh, the boatyard where this incident happened. So at that time, when I, when I canceled out that this was a legitimate raid, my next focus was, well, these people must have been phony cops people impersonating police officers, because there was a trend at that, at that time for people to dress up as police officers and, and, and raid uh, drug dealers' homes uh, and steal their cash and steal their drugs. To check the victim's son's story, investigators went to the marina where the raid took place. They interviewed the security guard who had been on duty that night. He said that seven or eight men in police uniforms rushed the marina and headed for one of the boats. They went right past the security guard. The security guard said, being South Florida, there's nothing unusual, you know? Go at it. He hadn't gotten a good look at any of them. Investigators later searched that boat, but found no clues. So they turned their attention to looking for the three men who had survived the raid. Two of the three survivors had minor police records, but could not be located at their last known address. The next day, Sentac 26 detectives played a hunch. They figured that the survivors would likely be going to the wake for one of the deceased victims. So we showed up at the funeral home um, with the names and identities of the people who we were looking for. The detectives were right. They recognized the survivors from arrest photos and approached the men as they entered. The men confirmed the boat was overrun by a group of raiders dressed like cops. But the men denied the boat was involved in drug running. They claimed they were simply having a party. They had been drinking beer with the three victims and two additional friends. And while they were there drinking beer and having a good time, uh, people in blue uniforms stormed past the front gate of the marina and uh, started yelling, police, police. The gunmen began assaulting them. They said several friends were thrown in the water by these individuals dressed in blue uniforms. Within minutes, all six men were overboard in the Miami River. But only three swam to safety. The investigation had now become a triple homicide. The Sentac 26 detectives were convinced the raid was yet another instance of fake cops ripping off drug dealers. But again, the survivors denied that drugs were on the boat and insisted they did not know why the men attacked them. They said they didn't see any badge numbers of police cars couldn't even tell which department the uniforms were from. With no detailed information from the two witnesses, the investigators were left without any significant leads. With the case stalled, the FBI offered their assistance. Special Agent Robert Martin. At about the same time that the, the homicide investigation began regarding the three bodies found in the Miami River, uh, an FBI cooperating witness uh, provided some information to us regarding uh, a group of police officers who were in, involved in some rip-offs. And he identified who those guys were, at least uh, uh, several of them, knew who some of them were, had conversations with them. Detective Alvarez got an unexpected call from an agent in counterintelligence. 
he says he needs to meet with us, that he has a motive and a possible information about our case. He put two and two together, so maybe this is related to this information that I'm getting uh, through my informant, Armando Un. Now we, we, can, we can narrow down. Armando Un, the FBI agent said, was a well-connected nightclub worker that knew about a group of crooked cops who were ripping off drug dealers along the Miami River. Sentac 26 detectives went to see Armando Un. But he did not want to see them. The interview went nowhere. It would take the murder of a friend before Armando Un would talk. A motorist was driving through the Everglades. He spotted something that piqued his curiosity, a wooden box. He pulled over. To his horror, he found a body inside. He called police. Detectives from Miami-Dade's Drug Task Force, CENTAC 26, were investigating the deaths of three men found floating in the Miami River. They hoped an informant named Armando Un could help them. His friend and employer had been found murdered in the Florida Everglades. His name was Luis Rodriguez, the owner of a nightclub in Miami's Little Havana district. He'd been shot several times in the head and then stuffed in a box rigged to spring open. A gruesome display. Investigating for Sentac 26 was Detective Alex Alvarez and Sergeant George Placencia. They needed to get Armando Un to talk. We never mentioned anything about the three bodies. Our ploy in speaking to him was that we were investigating the death of his best friend, the murder of his best friend. According to Detective Placencia, Armando Un was very candid. We sat down and chatted with him for, for a while about Luis Rodriguez. And uh, he said, yeah, Luis Rodriguez was involved in uh, drug trafficking. Would you recognize him? He admitted that Rodriguez was dealing drugs out of his nightclub and said he believed the men Rodriguez was involved with killed him. It is true that he was trafficking drugs. He was furious that his friend had been murdered and said he wanted to help. He was making money for everybody. He would but if he knew money. about police officers, real or fake, robbing drug dealers, he said nothing. He never mentioned that the police officers were involved. He did say that Luis Rodriguez was friendly with some officers. Thank you very much. I appreciate Armando it. Un seemed wary and selected his words carefully. When the interview ended, the detectives still had no suspects in the Miami River murders. All they really knew was that Luis Rodriguez was dead and may be the fourth drug murder victim in as many days. So then a city of Miami detective contacted Placencia and Alvarez with a surprising lead. He said that Luis Rodriguez had also worked for him as a police informant. He told us that Luis Rodriguez was giving him information about people who were dressed as um, and police imposters and were ripping off drug dealers and committing murders in Dade County. The detective explained that he had met Luis Rodriguez through a Miami patrol officer named Marco Rivera. I said, we need your help now. I need you to set up a meeting between the street cop and George and I, and let's tell him that we're investigating Luis Rodriguez's murder. That'll be the cover story. The meeting was set for that night at the Miami Police Department. Officer Ribeiro worked the late shift in 60 sector, police code for Little Havana. He verified that he knew Luis Rodriguez and that Rodriguez had, on occasion, been his informant. But then, without prompting, he brought up the Miami River drownings. He volunteered some information about the three bodies 
that were floating up in the Miami River. And he said that these guys stole the drugs themselves, and when the owner of the drugs found out about it, had them uh, murdered or they were thrown in the, in the water and drowned themselves, that there was no cops involved at all. His denial that officers were involved, which no one had mentioned, seemed too forceful. The Sentac 26 detectives tested him. We asked uh, this patrolman to repeat a story at, at, the, at the conclusion of our meeting, and we detected that uh, the story didn't fit the, the, the first story that he had told us. There was something wrong there. Rivera claimed a street source told him about the raid, so the detectives asked to speak directly with the source. Yeah, I guess so. You know, he's giving me a call tomorrow. I'll, okay. I'll try to contact him, and if I can't get in contact with him for any reason, I'll let you guys know. For the Sentec investigators, the case had taken a dramatic turn. This officer, sworn to uphold the law, seemed to be hiding something. The following day, Officer Marco Rivera introduced the detectives to the source who allegedly had information about the Miami River murders. I don't know if I should even be talking to these guys. I don't even know, bro. Rivera claimed his source could verify that drug trafficking Colombians had carried out the raid, not Miami cops. Hey, listen on, man. Hey, listen, we understand that you But as the source spoke, he had a hard time remembering details of his story. Officer Rivera had to help him remember, according to Detective Alvarez. The officer keeps having to correct him. No, 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 it happened like this, and tell him about this, and he's filling in the blanks for this guy who's obviously been, been coached and cued on what to say. So we knew at that point, obviously, he was covering something up. Officer Rivera's cover-up meant the detectives were faced with an even more serious problem. In case the deadly raiders were actually Miami police officers, they needed to be very careful. This is a problem that we weren't really um, trained or focused in to investigate, which is, you know, uh, we're not internal affairs investigators. We don't um, investigate cops. That wasn't our role. That wasn't our job. But we were charged with the responsibilities of investigating these murders, and if these murders were committed by cops, they were fair play we realized that if we were going to start to investigate cops, we'd have to do things very differently. The Sentac 26 detectives had to cover themselves. They asked the police chief to hold their personnel files as a precaution against internal leaks. We did a lot of things to protect our, our, our identity and our family's identity. We took every thing that we had in our names and took them out of our names so they couldn't trace where we lived and who we were. You know, we're investigating, they're going to find out who we are. So right away we, we, we built a wall between them and us. Once they felt safe, Sentac detectives began investigating the officers working the night shift in 60 sector, Little Havana. Officer Marco Rivera's beat. Sounds good. Okay. With the chief's permission, Miami PD's internal affairs gave Sentac 26 the personnel records for the officers in question. Well, the city of Miami Internal Affairs Unit you know, was very concerned. Uh, they were very cooperative. Uh, they, you know, the names that we provided to them, uh, they started looking into and uh, giving us the backgrounds that they had on these individuals. The investigators focused on a close-knit group of eight officers, all relatively recent hires who joined the force at a time when Miami was in crisis. In the spring of 1980, Cuban President Fidel Castro had announced he would allow thousands of political refugees to seek asylum in foreign countries. The U.S. agreed to accept 3,500. Then, unexpectedly, Castro announced that for the first time in years, he would also allow American boats to enter Mariel Harbor. The result was what became known as the Mariel Boat Lift. More than 120,000 Cuban refugees flooded into South Florida, which overwhelmed Miami's ability to handle them. Most were hardworking immigrants looking for a chance at the American dream. 
most, but not all. 10% of them was estimated were criminals that were dumped out of the uh, prison system of Fidel Castro. Um, so there was a spike in the crime wave in, in Miami-Dade County. To stem the rising crime rate, the city had to hire over 400 new cadets in three years. Instead of hiring the best candidate, they hired um, anybody who was just marginally acceptable. Uh, they just couldn't find enough uh, quality candidates, and they went for quantity as opposed to quality. Sentac 26 began surveillance, watching as the officers in question hung out together after hours, enjoying lifestyles far beyond the means of honest police officers. Marco Rivera was the suspected ringleader. Armando Garcia had recently become part owner of a bodybuilding gym. Osvaldo Coelho had just retired from the force. He was 30 years old, driving a $100,000 Lotus. It was easy to track their lavish spending. One officer uh, bought a home and uh, built this pool, and he paid the, uh, the developer cash, showed up with a bag full of cash, and gave it to him here for the purchase of my home. Still, the detectives had little solid evidence. Yeah, I'm in front of the restaurant. I don't see any uh, marked units over here, but our boy is definitely over here having coffee with some uh, friends uh, outside, but I don't see any units. They needed first-hand information, and they needed it soon. If these officers had already left at least three people dead, the detectives feared there could easily be more. Four people have been murdered in Miami over a $27 million drug deal gone bad. With so much money involved, the dividing line between the criminals and the cops blurred. The FBI offered their assistance to local law enforcement. Special Agent Robert Martin. We began an investigation which became a joint investigation into whether there was some police corruption in the city of Miami. Drug task force detectives with Sentac 26 had narrowed their investigation to a suspected group of corrupt Miami police officers. But the detectives needed inside information if they had any chance of cracking the case. They hoped they could get it from a reluctant police informer named Armando Un. They had already interviewed Un about the murder of his friend and partner, nightclub owner Luis Rodriguez. He seemed wary, perhaps afraid they too were dirty cops. Hey, Armando, when you look at these photographs, see if you recognize anyone. Detective George Placencia tried to win his trust by showing photos of their surveillance of the suspect officers. And he started looking through the photos, and he just paused. He dropped the photographs and shook her hand, and he says, you guys are doing a good job. Let's sit down and talk. But unfortunately, these things go wrong. So Un came down to Sentac 26, where he told Detective Alex Alvarez he figured he had nothing to lose. Okay. He was scared. He thought, well, if I stick it out with the crooked cops, they, pro they were the ones that probably killed my partner. And he said, well, if they killed him, the next person to go is me. In a marathon debriefing, he explained the origins of the rogue officers and their criminal enterprise. He said his friend and employer, nightclub owner Luis Rodriguez, had grown tired of the officers coming into his bar and shaking down his patrons for small amounts of drugs. He wanted to make sure that his customers weren't bothered. So he first started paying the cops off not to come. Soon he devised another plan that could make everyone some money. According to Un, Luis Rodriguez uh, said to the officers, hey, you know what? Instead of arresting these people that are coming over here with uh, petty drugs, why don't I set up deals 
you know, maybe multi-kilo deals, more drugs involved. And uh, when these people come over, I'll give you a description of their car, where they're coming from. You can stop them, steal their cocaine, bring it to me. I'll sell it. I'll give you a share. The officers agreed. What made this whole thing possible for these cops was they grew up and knew people who were in the drug trade. And that was the one aspect of what they had going for them. Patrolman Marco Ribera ran the ripoffs. It seemed a perfect plan. The dealers would never incriminate themselves by reporting the thefts, and Rodriguez would always come through with the cash. Un said the operation grew quickly, with more and more cops becoming involved. But they got greedy, wanting to do more ripoffs and bigger ones. And it all first began with... Rodriguez introduced them to a second bar owner who knew of larger shipments. Luis Rodriguez brought in another bar owner. He knew and he worked smuggling boatloads of drugs into the United States. And Rodriguez said, wait a minute, why stop, why stop at these one kilo, two kilograms of cocaine uh, drug bust? Why don't we go for the boatloads and get 300, 400, 500 kilograms of cocaine at one shot? Un didn't know about the raid where the three men drowned, but he did describe an earlier one the second bar owner had set up. A group of Miami officers had slipped aboard a boat in another marina, thinking the crew had left for the night. Clear. They knew exactly where the drugs were hidden. But during the unloading, they noticed the air conditioning was on. And suspected the crew was still on board, hiding. surrendered. The raiders wasted no time disposing of the crew, as they had in the other raid. This time, no one drowned. All the men swam safely to shore. The cops finished up, then drove off with about 200 kilos of cocaine, valued at over $10 million. Armando Un confirmed the names of the officers involved, the very one Sentak had been watching. Unfortunately, the investigators knew his credibility would be attacked in court. Jury's not gonna believe Armando Un a self-proclaimed admitted drug trafficker over, you know, half a dozen or a dozen respected police officers. They're just not going to believe it. So we need more evidence. What they needed was a confession on tape from the very cops they were investigating. They brought in the local bar owner from the drug raids and explained the evidence they had implicating him in the ripoffs. He reluctantly agreed to wear a wire and to meet with Officer Marco Ribera. But he said Ribera had been avoiding him for weeks, no doubt because of the Sentac 26 investigation. They would have to trick him into the meeting. Investigators hoped the results would be worth the risk. 
Detectives set up in a building across from a bar in the area Ribera patrolled and sent the informant inside. When surveillance units confirmed Ribera was nearby, detectives called 911 and reported a bar fight. Officer Ribera drove up just as they planned. Ribera entered, looking for the alleged fight, but everything was quiet. The informant made his move. He told the officer he had been subpoenaed by the U.S. Attorney's Office and wanted to know what to say. Ribera took the bait, but he didn't want to talk in front of witnesses. The corrupt cop spoke freely about his involvement in the drug operation. Ribera had no idea everything he said was being recorded. In Miami, investigators pursued a group of rogue police officers suspected of ripping off drug dealers and killing at least three of them. The detectives of Sentac 26 finally managed to tape an incriminating conversation with the group's leader, Officer Ribera, as he talked about the raids, the drugs, the dirty cops. Detective Alex Alvarez, it was key, it was key, key evidence because it was the corrupt police officer's own words about what he did, when he did it, and who he did it with. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Miami reviewed the tapes. Assistant U.S. Attorney Russell Killinger knew they would need as much evidence as possible to convince a jury that several Miami law enforcement officers were behind the murders and thefts. The tapes provided a good start, but Killinger needed more evidence to implicate the other officers. Perhaps Armando Un could get it. We wanted to get Un uh, uh, wearing a wire and talking to the other cops so that we get those other cops to confirm their own participation out of their own mouths. Wearing a wire, Un met with Miami officers Marco Ribera and Armando Garcia. He told them that investigators were asking him questions about the boat raids. They warned him not to cooperate. He assured him Sentec had nothing on any of them. But then they became suspicious, asking him if he was wired. That effectively halted all plans to record any more of the officers. But investigators were undaunted. We decided to more take more of an overt approach uh, in the investigation and, 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 and go to the, the next level, which was basically um, uh, subpoenaing witnesses to the grand juries, uh, issuing bank subpoenas uh, for bank records and financial records. Investigators began cataloging the assets of the suspects, including Marco Rivera's safety deposit box at a Miami bank. The box contained over $260,000 in cash, nearly 10 times his annual salary. Like Rivera, the other suspect officers left incriminating money trails. The money was burning holes in their pockets, and they were going out and spending money left and right. They'd buy 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollar cars, cash. They bought homes valued in excess of 200 thousand dollars, cash. They bought expensive furniture. They put down cash. Now this is an officer who's making 30 thousand dollars. We had a, an enormous amount of evidence. The financial records, together with the tape conversations, were enough evidence for arrest warrants to be issued. Two days after Christmas 1985, 
Sentac 26, Miami PD, and the FBI began the arrests, taking down six Miami cops, including the ringleader, Officer Marco Rivera. Officer Armando Garcia was also arrested without incident. Osvaldo Coelho and Emilio Rey surrendered in the following days. The trial began on September 29, 1986. Federal prosecutors thought they had a strong case. We felt pretty good about the case. We'd gotten pretty much all the evidence in that, that we had hoped to get in. Then, on January 21st, 1987, the jury came back with their verdicts. I remember the judge just kept looking, looking at the at the at the verdict forms, and he would look at one and put it down, and look at another and put it down, then pick up the other one, and look at it again, and and this went on for it seemed like an eternity, uh, and then he started shaking his head. The jury was deadlocked, causing the judge to declare a mistrial. One juror had refused to deliberate. Investigators were stunned as all suspects were released. That was really a low point in the investigation. We found out later because the jurors that the 11 jurors that voted for um, for conviction were so convinced that these officers, because of all the evidence, were guilty. They started coming forward and saying, you know, um, we started being contacted by we started getting contacted by friends and family members of uh, these cops offering us jobs and offering us money, and we knew that that was an attempt to try to to get us to sway our votes. The mistrial was an enormous setback. Detectives knew if they could not put these corrupt cops away, the people of Miami may never trust law enforcement again. A group of Miami officers were arrested and prosecuted for corruption, but chaos in the jury room resulted in a mistrial. All suspects were released. They were thrilled that they weren't convicted. Uh, what they didn't realize that it was probably a blessing in disguise for us because all that did is give us more time and we were more determined to find out more evidence against them. And that's exactly what happened. The prosecutor and detectives were unwilling to give up. With so much at stake, investigators needed a break. They finally got one. We found out um, that these officers had hired a hitman to kill um, Armando Un. That hitman was Killer Joe Martinez. He confessed to being hired, hoping he'd get leniency for another crime he had committed. We brought him in. He testified against the, the river cops. We were able to add more charges against them. And by that time, you know, the case was just becoming stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and they had nowhere to go and then they started to fold and they started to cooperate. The case finally broke wide open when one of the defendants, patrolman Emilio Ray, decided to confess. Through his lawyer, he had learned of the additional evidence against him. He hoped for sentencing leniency in exchange for his testimony. Uh, he described to us some, some fairly uh, bone-chilling uh, uh, conspiracies that, that, that had gone on and that were going on in an effort to, uh, to try to, to kill the government witnesses. All of the government's witnesses, especially Armando Un, were in danger. Investigators knew they had to use Patrolman Ray's confession to put more pressure on the other river cops. Facing the beefed-up federal case, ringleader Marco Ribera confessed. He had implicated uh, some 60 other city of Miami police officers in various uh, criminal activities. Unfortunately, Osvaldo Coelho and Armando Garcia fled the Miami area. Five months later, an FBI informant said Coelho was hiding in the Bahamas. The FBI has no formal jurisdiction outside the United States, 
so it maintains legal attaché offices called legats in many foreign countries. They work as liaisons with each country's national police. The FBI liaison asked the Bahamian police for their assistance. They agreed to help get Coelho. Coelho was wanted for taking part in massive and deadly cocaine ripoffs in Miami. Investigators knew he had a broad network of friends he could ask for help. Coelho called one of them several times to arrange for assistance. Yeah, I can help you. What do you need? Okay, I can do that. Good. See you then. What Coelho didn't know was that the FBI had already approached the friend, and he was working as an informant. The Bahamian police arrested Osvaldo Coelho without incident. He was extradited back to Miami to face charges of drug trafficking, conspiracy, and racketeering. Armando Garcia was the last of the rogue Miami cops still at large. On January 8, 1989, the FBI added Garcia to their 10 most wanted fugitives list. FBI Special Agent Robert Martin. We don't pick our top 10 fugitives lightly. They have to be people that we consider to be a serious danger, not only to society, but to the very nature and fabric of what makes our country what it is. And one of those things is, is uh, uh, honest, uh, honest law enforcement services. Uh, our Garcia was added to the list for that reason. The FBI had evidence that Garcia may have fled to South America, but had few leads. Special Agent Robert Martin ran the public corruption squad that kept searching for the elusive fugitive. Armando Garcia was, was uniquely qualified to, to understand what it was going to take to survive uh, out of the country. Uh, here was a police officer who knew every technique that we might use to, to find him or capture him. A guy that knew the difficulties uh, moving in and out of foreign countries and doing investigations in those foreign countries. On top of that, you had a guy that had a lot of money. Hey, I was just looking at these passports. Garcia could be anywhere. For four years, agents looked into hundreds of leads with negative results. Then, in late 1993, the FBI got a tip. A friend was planning to visit the Garcia family in Colombia. Agents worked with the Colombian police who followed the friend to an apartment in Cali. Agents believed that fugitive Armando Garcia was living there. Uh, the Colombian National Police set up a surveillance with a number of units. It was going to be a 24-hour surveillance and uh, waited to see if they could identify uh, anybody who had come out or traveled around with her. Three days later, they spotted Armando Garcia. The fugitive was caught off guard, unarmed. Holy Garcia! Garcia told them, said, I have $4,000 with me. I have, you see the jewelry I have, you see my automobile. I have goods and belongings in my apartment. You can have all of that if you just let me go. And to quote the Columbia National Police uh, official who came to Miami to, to, to describe events, uh, they then told Armando Garcia, we're not the dirty cops. You are. The last of the main suspects, Armando Garcia pleaded guilty to drug trafficking, racketeering, and tax evasion, and was sentenced to 25 years. When it was all over, 17 Miami officers were convicted for their involvement in the drug ripoff ring. It was the largest police corruption case in Florida history. In response to the scandal, the City of Miami Police Department formed its own internal investigations unit that targeted over 100 additional officers. 
they obviously were suffering from all the media exposure and then the embarrassment of having numerous officers arrested, but I think it made them a stronger department. When you weed out the bad officers, you know, um, it just make the, makes the good officers shine even brighter.